Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our special work session of Las Cruces City Council. Today is Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020. That's approximately 8.35 a.m. Just want to wish my beautiful wife, Rosie, a happy birthday this morning. I doubt if she's watching, but nonetheless, just thought I'd share that. So today we're going to re really listen to um, what's at, at hand. The discussion is uh, the minimum wage. Uh, on January 1st, 2021, the state's going to be increasing their minimum wage, and with that is uh, regarding tip wages as well, as the city is also looking to do uh, ours automatically increases as well. So there's going to be a presentation from staff, and we've invited several business owners and or employees uh, on the second part of this to join in and share with us uh, their comments. And so I'm going to turn it over to Leanne Dimouche, who's going to be uh, kicking this off. So Leanne, you want to take it away? Good morning and council and mayor. Let me share my screen this morning. Okay. Okay, do we see the full page? Yes. Okay, great. So this is a very similar presentation from the one that I did last week made a few little adjustments, added a slide, took a slide out, uh, but it's pretty much the same. I just told the mayor and uh, the probably the mayor pro tem as well, just to let you know that this past week I did talk to cabinet secretary Bill McCamley. I did invite him to our meeting today. He is hoping to join us approximately at nine o'clock. Um, he will have a little small presentation, I think, for, us and for any questions that council or um, the, the mayor may have. So I'm going to go quickly through this presentation. Uh, you'll notice how uh, similar it is, but this is about the minimum wage adjustment that will, as the mayor st uh, stated, will start January 1 of 2021. Just to give you a very brief background, and I'm going to try to go through this a little bit more, not quite thoroughly, but just understandingly, the ordinance that we developed back in approval of 2014, approximately this month, uh, stated in there that in the, in the year 2015, January 1 of 2015, the minimum wage will increase to $8.40. And then in January 1 of 2017, it will increase to $9.20. And then in uh, January 1 of 2019, it will increase to 1010. Of course, our uh, tipped wages are at 40% of whatever the minimum wage is. So starting in January 1 of 2020, we had um, we didn't actually in the ordinance state an exact amount for the minimum wage. What it stated was that we will be using an adjustment, a cost of living adjustment using the consumer price index, the CPI. And we will be using the CPI for August. And whatever that change is from year to year, that is what we will adjust uh, the a minimum wage by. So for January 1 of 2020, using the consumer price index, our uh, minimum wage went to $10.25 per hour. However, the state implemented a statute for their minimum wages as well for the whole state, and theirs started at $9 per hour. Of course, ours was higher, and so we remained with ours. You always use what is higher. So now we are moving towards, as you know, January 1 of 2021. We used again the uh, CPI to make the adjustment and the adjustment from the 1025 went to 1040. But as you can see, the state is now at 1050. Since they are higher, we will need to adopt the state's minimum wage. And as you can see, their minimum wage in 2022, January 1, jumps from 1050 to 1150. And then in January 1 of 2023, it will be $12. Now on the tipped employees, and here's where I need to apologize to council, I went straight from um, the 2020 to 2023. And I apologize for that because there are some increases in the state tipped wages. As you can see, for January 1 of 2021, 
uh, the state will be adopting an increase of $2.55 per hour. And then in 22, it will be $2.80 per hour. And then in 2023, it will be $3. And of course, ours is 40% of the minimum wage, which starting in January 1 of 2021 will be $4.20. That's 40% of the 10.50. So this is an example. This is a new slide that I put in. I did briefly go through this with uh, Cabinet Secretary McCamley to make sure that I um, had this correct, my correct thinking. And so I gave you an example, two examples for the city and then two examples with the state minimum wage. And this is using the minimum wage for January 1 of 2021, okay? So for the city, we have a base wage, I'm calling it a base wage of $4.20. Now, if an employee working, and I'm basing this on a 40 hour work week, okay? If they make in tips, let's say $6.30, the base wage and the tip wage per hour they come together and they equal a subtotal of $10.50. Well, the employer has to pay the minimum wage. So at this time, since the tips are higher, the employer will not need to make any difference up from that tipped wages. So he will only be paying out to the employee the $4.20 per hour. So the next example that I gave for the city was, of course, same base wage, $4.20. Let's say the tips for this 40 hour week only equal $2, okay? So that's a total of $6.20 per hour. So the difference there to make to the $10.50 is $4.30. That will come from the employer. So the employer will be out will be paying to the employee $8.50 per hour for that work week. Now, going over to the state, the state base wage, as I just told you from the last slide, is $2.55. If they made, if the employee made tips of $9 and, I mean, $7.95, then his total for his wages are $10.50. The employer does not have to pay any difference and the employer only has to pay the employee that base wage, which is $2.55. Another example using the base wage of the state, $2.55. Let's say the tips were not good that week. They were low. So let's say they only got tips of $2 per hour. So the subtotal for that is $4.55. The employer will have to pay the difference to make, you know, to make to the $10.50, $5.95 per hour. That means that the total uh, that the employer will be paying the employee for the tipped wages is $8.50 per hour. This is the slide. Um, I think the mayor was uh, earlier was talking about this slide. We did add a number three to this, but here for discussion, this was some discussion points that we came up with. Of course, we're you know getting guidance from council today on how we, we should move forward with the minimum wage. As far as number one, you can repeal our local ordinance and we can just utilize the state minimum wage. Uh, we can continue with our local ordinance um, each year. I can get to, uh, uh, I can determine the annual basis of the hourly rate comparison between the state and the city. And of course we can adopt whichever is higher. B would be, uh, that's A, and B would be that we would apply this tipped wage formula on the hourly rate, which is our 40%, okay? Or we can, number three is, this is one that we just recently added after the discussion from last week, we can do a hybrid. Um, our city attorney did say that we can adopt a hybrid. We can, adapt, uh, we can adopt part of the state statute and we can ab uh, adopt part of the city ordinance if council and the mayor would per uh, prefer. Um, and with this, this is the end of my slide presentation. I'm. Uh, like I said, um, Deputy uh, Secretary, Cabinet Secretary Bill McKinley will be joining us at nine. 
So if you have some discussion or if you want to go over any of the other slides, um, myself or um, staff are available. Thank you, Leanne. And if I could just focus on number three, that's what I was suggesting um, uh, when this discussion came up. Can you go back to your first slide, please? And it, oh, or that one, either one. The, in fact, the one that you have, not, that one right there is fine. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for adding the, the state. What, what I was trying to get at is, I think if, if we did adopt in the future a, a hybrid, what the way I look at it is this. There are some restaurants that are stronger than others. I mean, they have more capacity. They, they, you know, for whatever reason, they may uh, be able to absorb the, uh, yeah, they might be able to absorb the 420 an hour, but some that aren't. And if we were to, to adopt the hybrid, which is the state tip, that doesn't mean that a restaurant has to pay them the two, the two, the two uh, 55 an hour, they can go anywhere in between. They can pay them whatever they want, as long as it's over the 255. Um, so, so, you know, that's one of the things. I mean, you give that, that employer that flexibility that some employees, uh, it may be a, cha I mean, some employers, it may be a challenge. Uh, and that's what all I'm concerned about is giving them that uh, a possible option. Um, some may say, you know what, I can still continue to pay you the 420 an hour, great. But that, there may be one that says, you know what, I can only, you know, brings their employees together and, and, and tells them, you know what, I, I, this is a struggle here. Uh, I, I can do it at $3 or maybe three twenty-five an hour. But and by us putting, if we don't do that, give them that option or put it in, uh, replace our ordinance, they would be in violation of the city and, you know, theoretically could be subject to, to um, sanction. And so that's why I just wanted to have this discussion. That's really all this was about. And so I appreciate the council uh, at least uh, hearing the, uh, that, this idea as well as those employers who are willing to speak. So Leanne, I'm, I'm ready to have uh, those that have signed up. I think we had about. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, uh, yes. Bill Camley is actually on. So I don't know. Oh, oh yeah, let's, let's, let's talk to the secretary first. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate, appreciate you. I appreciate you having me on. Um, I've been able to get home uh, a couple times a month to see my mom. It is great. I was home last weekend. The weather was gorgeous. Um, and I really appreciate the work y'all doing. I miss you all very, very much. Um, I came on basically for two reasons. And I was able to hear, I was kind of doing double duty on another conference call, but was able to hear Leanne's presentation. I thought it was very good. I think there are two things that I would like to emphasize coming from the state perspective at Workforce Solutions. The first is that when you look at the tipped wage, the tipped wage is only what the employer uh, must pay a server or anybody else on the tipped chart if uh, they, their tips make over the minimum wage. So it is very vital to know that every worker in the state of New Mexico needs to come out of an hourly uh, part of work with whatever minimum wage is there. And so if the, um, the, the city minimum wage, I believe is 10, 20 something an hour right now, is that, is that wrong? Am I incorrect? I know you guys went up. 10, 25, I believe. 10, 25, right. So if I'm, you know, working at a server at Si Senor and I um, only get $5 in tips and the current rate is about four bucks for what I'm getting in terms of the tip wage. There's still uh, a little bit of money left. The employer is responsible for making up that difference. So the minimum wage needs to be something that every worker comes away with. Okay, so that's something that's really, really critical to know. I got asked by a news organization if unemployment could kind of make up the difference. And the answer is no, because everyone needs to come away with whatever minimum wage is there. The second thing, Mr. Mayor, member of the council, I would like to say is that we here at the Workforce Solutions Department, through our Labor Relations Division, are in charge of enforcing minimum wage laws statewide. And if people are not paid minimum wage levels. We call that wage theft. It's a crime and we enforce it. Furthermore, Mr. Mayor and members of the committee, the, the governor believes very, very strongly, as do I, that a fair day's work deserves a fair day's pay. 
And in our department, we enforce whatever the highest minimum wage levels are, depending on the level we're talking about, either the tipped wage or the regular minimum wage. Uh, I think it's important to note, as Leanne talked about, that state law um, through Senate Bill 437 from 2017 determines that at the beginning of this upcoming year, the state minimum wage will increase to 10.50 an hour. I believe that is going to be more than what the Las Cruces ordinance will uh, propose. So I think you guys are going up to 10.40 somewhere in that because of the. Yes, sir. Um, so next year, the state will be enforcing in the city of Las Cruces the 10.50 an hour level because that is the higher of whatever wage is out there. Um, in, in terms of this discussion today, uh, y'all can do whatever you want, but the, um, the tip wage, we will enforce whatever is higher. So if it's the state level, which will be at that 255 level or whatever, if you decide to stay, for instance, at where you're at right now, we enforce those higher levels. So Mr. Mayor and members of the council, I think those are like the two things that I think are very critical as a part of the discussion. I know that tip wage discussion can be a little complicated uh, and, and hard to understand for some folks, but people really, really need to be coming away starting on January 1st, 2021 with that 1050 an hour. And that tip wage is only part of that. Um, but we will enforce the higher of whatever is out there. And, and Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, if I can be a resource and answer any questions, specific questions you all might have, I do have a little bit of time and I tried to get out here early. So if you guys had questions, I could answer them for you. I would be extremely willing to do so. I appreciate that, Mr. Secretary. I just have one quick question. I don't know if you heard my uh, example earlier, but um, so basically let's say the city adopted the state's uh, minimum wage for for three months. When I say adopted, I know we have to pay the 1050, but I'm talking about the, the tip wage portion. So let's say we did it for three months. And my, my suggestion or my thinking was, you know, with COVID in the winter time, just a little, little cautious here. Um, but anyways, so let's say we adopted the, the 1050 that the state has, and then the 235, I think tip wage. That doesn't mean that an employer, if they wanted to, could pay their server three or three fifty an hour, as long as it's above the state minimum that you uh, said, correct? Mr. Mayor, that, that is correct. An employer can pay whatever they want, yeah. as long as they're hitting both the minimum level for the hourly rate for the servers, as well as that overall level if the tips do not make up the difference. <clears throat> Secretary, it looks like uh, one of our one of our uh, business owners looks like she has a question. Uh, Martha Lozano Curon, uh, do you mind taking a question from members of the public? Uh, Not at all. Okay, uh, Martha, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, I just know, need you to I state your name, please. Uh, Mar uh, Martha what, what? Lozano Hyphen Curon, and I'm the administrator for Home Care in Cabdoniana, which is a home health agency. And my question is, um, if you're raising the minimum wage to 1050, are you going to raise the rates that we're getting reimbursed for the PCS services waiver? Because that's my concern, is that the minimum wage keeps going up and our reimbursement does not, but yet we're expected to pay insurance over time and all this other stuff for those homemakers, and we're not going to break even. We're going to lose. So, Mr. Mayor and ma'am, I, I apologize. I'm not the person that can answer that question. Uh, that is a different state department, and I'm honestly not sure which one that would be. Uh, our responsibility at the Workforce Solutions Department is to, in this area, enforce wage laws. Uh, but I will, I, I hear you, and I have a, a little cabinet meeting I'm going to have later this week, and I will actually bring that up with some of the folks who might have a better answer for you. And I will uh, pass your concerns along because it's something we're not hearing from, not just hearing from you guys, but other uh, agencies as well in terms of early childhood centers and those sorts of things. So I will pass that along. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And let's see here. Councilor Beta Stuvi. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Secretary, for joining us today. Um, I have a couple questions just regarding state law as far as it um, applies to things like credit card charges. Um, are employers allowed, um, sorry, I've been reading up on different areas, um, here in New Mexico, um, do we address if employers are entitled to um, share processing fees or credit card surge 
fees with um, tipped out um, employees, or is that something that is designated as a, a charge that is between the patron and the customer? Mr. Mayor and Councillor, it is my, I, I don't know the specific answer to question. I'll have to ask some of our attorneys on that. It is generally my understanding that a tip is a worker's takeaway. And so the worker should be able to get whatever the tipped amount is. Now, it's a fair question because if the tip is part of the employer's process and there's a fee charged with that, um, I, I'm not actually sure of that. I will write that down and hopefully try to get you an answer. It's a good question. And I'm that, that kind of detail I'm not uh, sure about, but I will ask. Is that is that fair enough? Thank you. I know that's, you know, it's a kind of an in-depth, but I'm just looking yeah. at ways that things are processed. And I'm not sure if you can answer, um, but do we have any data on servers? Um, I know a lot of the stuff that we have is all based upon a 40-hour work week. Um, as a server myself for a very long time working in the restaurant industry, there were very few of us that were honestly a full 40 hours. In general, it was anywhere depending on if we were, we had second jobs, um, we were college students, we were 12 and 32 hours. And so I'm not sure if we have any sort of information um, that just says what is that app average rate here in New Mexico for servers. Mr. Mayor, Council, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Can you restate it, please? I, I apologize, I'm, I'm not That's understanding right. what you're trying to ask. Do we have any information on what the average hourly um, or weekly uh, hours worked by servers? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, I don't have that right now. I can ask our economist if we can come up with an estimate. Okay. I, I don't know if, yeah, it, that's going to be a hard one because we would have to break out the wages we had, the reporting we have uh, into who would specifically be service. And that's really tough too, because within, for instance, the restaurant industry, not everybody working those jobs is a tipped worker, right? You've got people in the back of the house who may not share tips, who need to be getting paid whatever the regular women wages or, or higher. Uh, let me ask our economist if there's a way to break that out because I don't know. What I will say is this, in terms of unemployment, you bring up a really good point. Um, it's created a lot of consternation, especially as COVID has hit because the unemployment system was created in the 1930s when we had a very, very different economy. You had a lot more people working for one employer for a specific amount of hours per week. And right now, what we're seeing is that for many, many New Mexicans, many Las Cruces is just not the case. You've got people that are you know, working 20, 30 hours a week at a, at a part-time regular job, maybe serving on the weekends, maybe driving Uber as a side hustle, uh, you know, Saturday nights, maybe working at their cousin's yoga studio. I mean, it, people are not just at one place. They're, they're putting different types of jobs together. And sometimes they're doing it at the same time. Sometimes they're working four or five jobs in a year. And so uh, this is kind of a bigger discussion about what unemployment is overall and, and is the system that we have now that was built almost 100 years ago uh, working for people right now. That is, it's something that I've had to learn a lot about over the last six months. But let me get back to your stuff. Let me ask our, our economist if there's any way possible to break that down and I'll try to get you what we can. I just don't know. That's a very specific question. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, one final thing, and it's probably something it might have to be looked at later, um, but are we tracking um, industries uh, during this time of COVID to see how many are um, being either furloughed or let go from the different industries like restaurants or uh, their parts. Um, so that, oh. Thanks. Um, and if we have any of the demographics for here in Las Cruces. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Madam Councilor, I don't know if we have it for Las Cruces. We probably have it on a county by county breakdown. We can probably get that for Doniana County. 
Um, I don't know if we have it for the city of Las Cruces per se. I will say, because we just released the, the press release on this on Friday, the two biggest private sector industries that have been hit uh, by COVID in terms of the unemployment situation are the leisure and hospitality industry. So mm -hmm. restaurants, hotels, ski hills, the, the whole run of the gamut there. That that has been by far the most hardest hit industry. And the second one down is the um, the mining industry. Um, and that's mostly, when you go up to like silver, for instance, uh, the mines up there, the freeport McNaran, they've really had to furlough a lot of folks off. So we definitely are aware that those have been the two hardest hit industries that we're looking at. You also look at local government, frankly, uh, in terms of the, the public sector, uh, local government non-education has been the sector that has had the highest amount uh, of job losses so far. And I don't have to tell you all about the, the difficulties there. But I, I, I will try to get those for Donyana County let me get you the leisure and hospitality numbers for Donya Anna. Is that what you're asking? Because I know yes, you guys don't have a lot you. of writing. So, okay. I appreciate it. Thank you, Secretary, and thank you, Mayor. Looks like we have Councilor Bencomo has her hand up. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, Secretary McKinley. It's good to see you. Um, thanks for being with us. I wondered if you could talk more about wage theft, um, if you could talk more about um, perhaps what industries you've seen that um, – where those claims come mostly from and then like what that process is like. Sure, um, Mr. Mayor and Councillor. So the industry that we've seen most in terms of wage theft complaints is definitely the restaurant industry um, by far. That is the, the highest industry. Second is probably home health where we've received complaints that way. Uh, we also received some complaints from the agriculture industry from uh, some farm workers. So that one's a little bit harder um, as trying to get folks in that industry, um, the, the details they need to file these complaints is a little bit more difficult because of the transient nature of the, of the workforce and everything like that. We, I was actually down in Hatch uh, last fall where we did a, we, we participated in a big uh, workers forum for the ag industry, letting people know what the process is. Our people try to reach out and be a pro as much uh, of a proactive force as we can in that regard to let people know what's going on. I, I will also say, we actually had a video town hall with the restaurant industry and um, the, the restaurant association was really working with us uh, as well as the association of commerce and industry to talk about wage theft, because their argument is, look, if some people out there are cheating by not breaking the law, that not only hurts the workers, it also is a bad thing for the other businesses that are playing by the rules. And so we've been doing everything we can to really, uh, show people what the rules are, how to follow them, what some of the best practices are. And a lot of times, I'll be honest with you, um, some of the things that we see are not on purpose. It's just their paperwork issues. And so uh, some of the efforts we had to make with the business community have been really kind of, hey, look, here's some best practices that you guys can do to make sure your records are in place and you're paying people the right way. Um, we have had some bad actors. Uh, I will say that there is a restaurant in Albuquerque that was probably one of our worst offenders. We've taken them to court. Um, we have basically, since the governor has come into office, we have kind of retooled what we're doing here in the, in the Workforce Solutions Department. And we started working with city uh, attorney's offices. We are working with the Albuquerque City Attorney's Office to enforce the um, minimum wage there with the restaurant I was, I was referencing before. We've had outreach to the Santa Fe City Attorney's Office to figure out how we can work with them. And we'd be more than happy to work with your city attorney's office uh, to figure out how we can partner. Because let's face it, um, the resources for these types of offenses can be very limited. And the more partnerships we can form to do things better together, the more we're gonna be effective in enforcing these rules. Thanks, Secretary, I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, we appreciate that. And so I think now we're gonna go ahead and, um, uh, and we recognize your schedule, Mr. Secretary. I was just gonna open it up to the uh, business owners who've signed up first that I'm gonna allow to speak. And then those that have come on who haven't had a chance to sign up, uh, whoever's left. So um, you're welcome to chime in if you hear anything uh, Secretary McCamley, or like I said, oh, we know your schedule. We appreciate you uh, doing what you're doing. And um, on a personal note, I have to tell you, of all the secretaries I've worked with, you, you, you're you a hustler. You work hard. You work every day, it looks like. So that's good. I like that. I like guys who work every day. So good. Uh, I don't mean it like that. I mean, I know, you, you know you're on a salary and everything. Okay. Uh, so we have here 
Before we begin, there's a gentleman by the name of Charles Clements. He asked, he, he has the secret formula he wanted to share with us. Are you on, uh, Mr. Clements? Mr. Mayor, I'll, he is. I'll ask him to unmute. Okay. Mr. Hello. Clements? Hi, good, good yeah. morning. So I know you're good not morning. a business. Good morning. I know you're not a business owner, but uh, it's very interesting. You said that you 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 had the uh, perfect solution. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let you have well, I'm, uh, five, I'm gonna let you have five minutes to give us the okay your wisdom. Well, well, I'm not gonna give you a perfect solution okay. because I, I'm not omniscient. Okay. Yes, sir. But, I just need you to state uh, your name, please. I, okay, Charles Clements. Okay, go ahead. And uh, it, thinking this thing over and watching the uh, events over the past while, even well, the last 60 years probably, uh, we've got a situation that is being imposed upon the city of Las Cruces. It's causing an awful lot of this stress in the first place. And we need to understand that that system that has been imposed upon us is, is a deliberate system. So we have to have a deliberate reaction that's more than a case of passing the pain, which is what I think we're kind of stuck with right now. Who gets stuck with the pain of this uh, situation? And I think that we need to look at our economic development system differently and this is something that that could be used to address. If we put together a co-op type of operation in this town to address these situations and help the business people work through uh, situations that could help reduce their costs and that sort of thing, could help the employees uh, maintain a, a standard of living, you could work a lot of things out that way because we have a smart community, we have a, a good sense of community, and but we need to involve everybody we can in making that solution happen because we're, we're dealing with a hostile economic system at the national level and we have to start correcting that where we can. And we have examples. Uh, the Bank of North Dakota is, a, is an example of one approach on that the uh, Mondragon is a world-class example of how you deal, go from rags to riches, if you were using a cooperation. Uh, there's credit, our own credit union system is the same thing. I mean, uh, the banks fell apart in 2008 and the credit unions just sailed right on through. Uh, we can use a cooperative method to address this and I think we'll be far more successful than if we try and pick which who gets the pain. And I think that that's a mindset we need to adopt as we approach this whole problem here. Do you, uh, and I guess that's the, that's the silver bullet that I'm offering is let's step outside this framework that we've been working with for the last 60 years in this country that has been decimating most of the people in the country and go into this cooperative framework and use the community to create its own economy, as it were. And that'll, I think it'll solve a lot of our problems. And that's what I got to say. No, I, I you know what, Mr. Clements, I, I fully support what you're, what you're trying to say. I don't know if you'd believe this or not, but I've actually been toying with that model, not at the city, not at, not at the local level, but this is something there that, that I think it could be done uh, from a national standpoint. Uh, do me a favor. Um, I don't know how, I mm -hmm. think you emailed Mayor Pro Tem Gandara, and I think that was forwarded on to me. Will you please leave your yes. contact information with the city clerk? Cause I'd like to have a discussion with you in the future. And I'd share with you what the idea is that I have. And it's exactly like what you're talking about a co-op. Uh, and then, but my, my thinking was the co-op is what gets it started. And then later it transitions over to various uh, people who want to invest. And then they, they become the, the board of directors and they become the owners and then government's out of it. We help start it. Well, yeah, well I, it going, I and agree. Then we're out. Yes, sir. Okay. But if you wouldn't mind leaving that information with 
uh, the city clerk, that would be great. And I'd like to talk with you. Okay, I sure will. Yes, sir. Thank you I very sure much. I sure will. Thank you. Your idea. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. <clears throat> bye bye. Okay, next we have Amy Miller, Courtyard by Marriott. Is Amy uh, available? Yeah. I just need Good you morning. to state your Good morning. I just need you to state your name, Amy, and I'll give you five minutes to start, please. Good morning. My name is Amy Miller. I'm the general manager for the Courtyard by Marriott Las Cruces at NMSU. I wanted to speak briefly in opposition regarding any minimum wage increase. Um, per statement from our New Mexico Secretary of Tourism, Jen Schroer, the COVID-19 pandemic has severely damaged the tourism industry in New Mexico. Average visitor spending has dropped $403 million each month, according to Tourism Economics. Cumulative loss of revenue exceeded $2 billion from March to July. As of August, there are nearly 24,000 unemployed workers from the accommodations and food service sector, costing a cumulative total of $271 million in unemployment benefits. All told, the 2020 projected cost to the state in lost visitor spending, taxes, and unemployment benefits is $4.3 billion. So bottom line is this pandemic has caused temporary and permanent staff reductions and some of our business and industries, um, businesses in our industry have closed and may never reopen. Any additional expenses at this time, I think, you know, could really break businesses in our industry. I would, I would like to ask that there's no uh, minimum wage increases for 2021 as many businesses are struggling just to stay open at this time. Okay. Well, thank you, Amy. We, we appreciate your comments. Yes. Um, next is uh, Renee Rodriguez. It says uh, continual growth. Uh, Renee, are you available? Mr. Mayor, she doesn't appear to be online. No? Okay. We already heard from Martha Lozano. Uh, Mr. Jerry Silva from Save Mart. Jerry, here. Yes, Mr. Mayor and the, uh, everybody involved. Thank you. Good morning. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to, opportunity to uh, listen in. At this point in time, I really don't have any comment other than the... Uh, Mr. Silva, can you just state your name, please? I'm sorry, Jerry Silva from Save Martin Las Cruces. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. Oh, not a problem. At this point in time, we just the, uh, really just wanted to listen to what, see what everyone had to say. I, uh, I do agree with the uh, individual that just talked right before me. At this point in time, businesses are really struggling to do any kind of an increase. Uh, it would really help us if we could have a, uh, not have an increase. I mean, the one in 20 next year is not that bad. Uh, I will be okay with that personally, but speaking with other business owners, especially the smaller ones would definitely have a hard time. Uh, they're having to lay people off and that's kind of working against the, uh, what we all want to do in the first place. We want to, help people have a better, uh, more money to help them out. But having to lay people off, that's, they're losing jobs and having a hard time finding other jobs. I've had people coming to me uh, trying to find anything they can. And I've been employing as much, as many as I can. Uh, but that's where, that's where we, we were at. So if we can really consider that and look at that and uh, I don't want to take too much more time, but if, you, my phone number is available. If you want to talk to me further, uh, I would be more than happy to uh, get more information on that. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, we have Councillor Sorg who has a question. I don't know if it's for, for you, uh, Mr. Silva. Councillor Sorg? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, this is for uh, Secretary McCamley and anyone else that uh, can add to the answer. Uh, this new uh, increase in the minimum wage starting in January uh, of a 10.50 an hour uh, is not something the city of Las Cruces can change, can we, Mr. McCamley? Mr. Mayor, Councilor, no, that is state law. It was passed that in the session of 2017. 
And that uh, is the first increase, I, I believe, in over a decade, um, the one we had at the beginning of last year. And, and like I said earlier, the um, we enforce whatever higher wage there is. So there's, there's actually four, excuse me, there are five local government entities in New Mexico, which had different higher minimum wage levels. Uh, the city of Santa Fe, the county of Santa Fe, the city of Albuquerque, the county of Bernalillo, and the city of Las Cruces. It gets a little complicated, Mr. Mayor and Counselor, and I'll just let you know that um, over the next few years, if everything stays status quo, we're going to have a little bit of shifting wages that we enforce because uh, you all have a cost of living increase that gets tacked on at the end of your, your uh, wage every single year. Whereas because the, um, the state hadn't had an increase in so long, the, the compromise that was passed in state law was to go to 9, 1050, 1150, and then 12 in consecutive years. So this upcoming year, for instance, um, if this, if the, city uh, wage stays the same, the law stays the same, then the state minimum wage will actually be higher. And that is the law that we would then enforce. And as it goes up um, to 12, if state law stayed the same, it would take a while for the city to catch back up because of your cost of living increases are only gonna go up X amount every year. So for a while in the city of Las Cruces, the, um, the state minimum wage will be the one that, that is enforced. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I would add to that, I, that I wanted to bring that up because people don't understand that the city doesn't have control over the state. Uh, as simple as that. And uh, rather, it's the other way around. And uh, except for the fact that you know, we could go higher than the 1050 next year. That's a possibility. Anyway, so um, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, so that everybody that's hope is listening on this uh, in this meeting here understands that. Thank you so much, Secretary. That's excellent. Thank you, Councilor Sorg. Councilor Sorg, I don't know if you I don't know if you heard this, but uh, yes, we do have to go to the higher of the 1050 of the state, but we could also go to the the city could also drop to the lower tipped wages of the of the state. You're aware of that too. And oh, yes, any, I'm very much aware. Of that, and right? and even though it was if it was to be dropped an employer can still, if they choose to, pay whatever they wanna pay as long as it's at that minimum. So if they wanna say, you know what, um, I don't need quite as much relief as, as the next person, and maybe I'll pay, if I can pay three or 350 uh, an hour for the tip wages. And see, the, the, the whole thing is, unless we were to change our ordinance, if we didn't change it, legally, that employer can't do that because that is wage theft. But what, but if we were to do a, some type of an ordinance that allowed um, us to, I mean, allowed uh, employers to, to match the state tipped, they can go anywhere in between. Just like you said, they can pay more if they want to. Because there's going to be some that are going to be stronger. They can do the 420 an hour. But yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that there may be some that aren't, and they're going to just say, you know what, I got to just, I got to close up. And, and, and you know, and, but they might be able to make it at the, at the state tipped. Yeah, they they you, might Mr. be Mayor. able to, you know, so. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And then I'm also cognizant of the fact that just yesterday we passed uh, uh, a resolution that allows uh, businesses to get some financial help in those cases that you're describing. Um, and so that helps every, all the businesses also. Just wanted to point that out. They are, have that option to get uh, financial help. That, that, that's, Councilor, that's not, not only if it's possible, if it's legal, a one-time thing, that's a, that is truly a Band-Aid. Uh, it's that that'll go that'll go by real quick. I mean, look at the look at the U.S. government, the two trillion in, in no time. It's it's gone. So, anyways, uh, let's see here. Next, we have Marcy Dickerson from the game. Is she is she available? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Oh, there you are. Just need you to state your name, Marcy, please. Five this minutes, is Marcy please. Dick. This this is Marcy Dickerson from the Game Sports Bar and Grill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Counselors, for hearing me. Um, what I want to talk about is I want to give you some information on what I'm going to call the economics and what the server paycheck looks like. So our the servers come to work every day and they generate tips every day and they take those ch tips home at the end of the evening. Now, every one of those tips that they earn generate a tax liability. So you have to pay taxes on your tips just like you do your hourly wage. 
So what happens is after, basically we pay every two weeks, after 14 days of generating all these tips and taking that money home, you have acquired a tax liability. The tax liability then is paid out of the hourly wages. The reason I'm explaining this is most servers, and I've talked to several restaurants in town, most servers do not actually get a paycheck on paper. They get a $1 paycheck or a zero paycheck, depending on how the accounting works. But most servers, their tax liability for the income they earn every day is paid for by those paychecks. The reason I want to explain this is, Mr. Mayor, if you drop back the, the tipped wage, minimum wage, back to the states, it actually will not have a negative impact on most of these servers. It will have a negative impact on the government because they have to collect those taxes and they won't have access to that. But it does not actually have a negative impact on those servers because the servers don't see paychecks anyway. Now, I'm sure there are some of those servers in the community that probably don't earn, don't earn tips or are working in an environment where the tips are very small. We do know, as you all have explained multiple times over this call, that the employer is responsible for making sure those servers earn more than minimum wage. For example, most of the servers that work for me in my world, if they are full-time servers, they make anywhere from 36000 to 40000 a year. If they are part-time servers, like Counselor Stubes um, was talking about, where they're going to school or doing that, and they work like 20 hours um, twenty hours a week, that type of thing, they usually end up about twenty five to 30000 a year. So it is, you know, there's a lot of money to be made in the serving industry, but really their paychecks don't like most of them don't even pick them up because they're you know a dollar two dollars or not much because that's how the tax liability for their wages is paid so realistically this proposal to drop the tipped wage back to the state and stay within the state guidelines actually would help businesses because the businesses will not have to pay those additional wages it really won't have a negative effect on the servers because they're not they, they, it's just tax liability anyway. So they're not really seeing that. It really won't affect them in a negative way. It will help us because something else to also let you know, for every dollar that we pay in wages, it actually costs the business anywhere from $1.50 to $1.80 an hour. By the time we are done with all of the taxes on those wages, also our workman's comp, our insurance, so many of our other things is based on what our payroll is that it actually, for every dollar we go up, depending on what your rates are yeah. on those other things, it's between $1.50 and $1.80 additional. Did it, and Mr. Mayor, I know it's kind of hard over the phone to see, but did, did that make sense? Did, did, did you understand what I was saying? Yeah, no, yeah, I, you know, I've never been a server, but that makes sense. I, I, um, so basically they get paid theoretically two ways. Their tips primarily, that's their big bulk. And then uh, their, their, their regular little, what you refer to as a little paycheck. Yes, sir. So they're, they're, some, they're, they're hourly checks. Well, basically they're hourly checks. So they make, you know, 425 an hour. Well, most servers are incurring a higher tax liability per hour off their tips than the 425. So they don't actually get paychecks. That, that money that is paid to them hourly goes toward their tax liabilities. So it pays their taxes. So it really doesn't matter if it's $4 or $2, that tax liability, you know, all that's right there is the same. You can't write a negative paycheck and you can't take it from the employees. So like our system writes a $1 paycheck. Vince from Lorenzo's system doesn't do a paycheck. I've, um, I've spoken with myself, well, I'm sorry. I, I've spoken with Vince from Lorenzo's um, C Senior, El Sombrero, and several other restaurants in town just to make sure that it wasn't just my staff that was not generating paychecks because that, that money pays their tax liability. So what I'm saying again is that you can take the minimum wage, minimum tipped wage from the $4 to the $2 range, whatever those cents are, and you actually will not have a net effect on the servers. Like those people who are serving, those who are working every day, you won't have a net effect on them. On a side note, you are absolutely correct, Mr. Mayor, on the fact that some restaurants will continue to pay more. For example, in our world, our bartenders make more per hour. Our good servers make more per hour. We give raises to servers the exact same as we do our kitchen staff and the rest of our staff. So not, you know, if you took this to $2 an hour, I don't think everyone in town would drastically drop it down. 
but it does give us an option to get more servers in at a less cost. And like I say, it has no negative net effect to the servers themselves. Uh, looks like Councillor Vasquez and Councillor Beta Stuvi have questions, I presume, of you. Uh, you're willing to uh, respond to those? Absolutely. Okay. Councillor Vasquez and then Councillor Beta Stuvi. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I just want to point a clarification. So, uh, Marcy, thank you for being here uh, today uh, and discussing um, your position on this. So, uh, so, so, from what you're saying, if a server's um, wages go towards paying the uh, the taxes on their tipped income, right? Um, then essentially that offsets, uh, like you said, their check to pay their wages. So wouldn't wouldn't a server with lower wages, lower hourly wages, um, have less to pay to cover their tipped income taxes versus if they had higher hourly wages? They would have more money to pay their 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 taxes on their tipped income. Isn't that right? So here, and I'm sorry. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, so here is a very interesting financial conundrum, and you may have to find somebody much smarter than me. We know they're out there, but what we see with our staff is this. So those servers, you are correct. So they now there's two dollars to pay that taxed income. They can't take it from them. So what happens is basically it kind of goes away. And the reason why I say that is so at the end of the year, when they are filing their taxes, they say they made this much money, they paid in this many taxes. Well, when most of these people go in and they finish all the rest of their taxes and you know, and putting in their expenses and their childcare and everything else, they all get money back anyway. So there's, I have never met a server that ran into the situation to where they owed money at the end of the year. So I don't know exactly accounting wise where that where that debt goes, if you will. I know that the servers that we deal with, and like I say, an accountant would probably be a better question, but the servers that we deal with, they're still getting money back at the end of the year. And, you know, and that debt basically just goes away. And Marcy, how, how often would you characterize um, that servers don't report their tipped income accurately to avoid tax liability. How often does that happen as far as you know? Well, let's talk about in the, I'm sorry, let's talk about in the past and currently. So in the past, I would say that servers don't report their tipped income a lot. And what has changed in the last five to six years is the restaurant industry used to be a very big cash industry, which meant people paid cash, they tipped the servers in cash, there you go. Right now, just speaking for myself, my restaurants run 99 to 98%, you know, depending on what month it is, credit card receipts. So now, even though, you know, now all their credit card tips are automatically reported because those are in the computer, I will say there are people that leave cash tips in those. I can't tell you whether those tips are reported or not. I'm pretty sure they're probably not. We encourage our wait staff to report all their tips because it's very important to do. But, you know, I think we're all aware that, you know, somebody gets handed a 20, they put it in their pocket. Um, but yeah, now it's a, a little different because of the fact that, you know, most most all restaurants right now are running off credit card, debit cards, you know, some type of electronic currency to where it can be traced. It's not quite like it used to be. Did that answer the question? Yeah, Marcy, and I think for me, it, it actually it actually raises another question because um, I'm not condoning the practice of uh, hiding wages from the IRS or on tipped income, but because those wages now have to be reported and are reported, their tax liability has gone up, right? So servers are probably having a much higher tax liability because of the credit card transactions. And so to me, that just makes the case stronger for higher hourly wages that allows them to offset that additional um, tax liability that they have, whereas before that might not have been a huge problem if, you know, they were maybe not reporting their, their wages um, accurately. So to me, it, it's, uh, to me, it seems like the servers need that higher hourly wage to now pay for the tax income that is all recorded through the electronic payment systems. Um, <coughs> if you will. So the point of this whole discussion was that the mayor 
was proposing a way to help businesses and to help businesses by lowering the payroll, the, the potential payroll that they have to give these businesses a, a brief breather, if you will, a timeout, a moment for them to help catch up on the loss of income for 2020, the loss of, you know, incredible expenses that we incurred while we were closed. And that is the benefit of lowering this. So if we're looking at it with, is there something that we can do to benefit and help the businesses without directly hurting these servers, then that is what I'm explaining. I, I really, you know, like I say, most of those tax liabilities float off into the sunset and they're never actually incurred. And I know that sounds weird, but that's just how it works. So it really doesn't matter to them. Like the servers don't see it. There's no net benefit to the servers. I understand the theory because all of us have different types of jobs. So to us, the taxes flow all the way through. We pay our taxes every month off our paychecks and that type of thing. But with this level, most of these people get a tremendous amount of money back anyway at the end of the year. I mean, I don't have, to be honest with you, I don't have a single person on my payroll other than myself that has to pay taxes at the, at the end of the year. Every one of them, it, it, it's a standard party every year that every one of them is getting tons of money back because they have the child credits. They have all these other credits because um, most of them have children and lots of them. Uh, you know, so I really just don't see there's a negative effect. If there's something you're going to do to help the businesses, which I believe is the goal of the mayor, I'm not sure of the council, but that is the goal of the mayor's proposal is to help the businesses. This is a really good way to do it without an incredible net, you know, loss to anyone else. Thank you, Marcy. I appreciate um, your, uh, your comments. And I think, you know, for me personally, I can't separate helping businesses without helping the workers. I think that that has to come hand in hand. I think a healthy business has a healthy workforce as well. Um, I, I do have one question for Secretary McCamley. Um, Secretary, I don't know if you heard our discussion there about increased tax liability for servers um, based on, you know, the electronic uh, payment for tipped wages and even thinking about, I think, also, servers' wages get treat or server servers' tips get treated as wages when it, it's an automatic tip. So, if you have like a party of six or more, seven or more, and that fifteen percent gets tacked on, no matter what the bill is, I believe restaurants have to treat those as wages according to new federal law. Um, and so, that often happens in large settings, or in groups, you know, at restaurants where you have um, larger folk, larger groups of folks. Um, but anyhow, in, in terms of your experiences, um, perhaps working with servers in the industry or knowing that industry, um, how how might you characterize the tax liability that they have and how our higher hourly wages help offset that tax liability, essentially producing more income for them, um, you know, without having to have a, a larger tax burden and getting more money back? Yeah, Mr. Chair and Counselor. Um, well, first of all, let me just say that, that I have been on the phone trying to get answers for Councillor Abeta Stuve's questions. Um, I may have one by the time I, I've got a few more minutes. And if I get one on the leisure and hospitality industry in Doniana in the next few minutes, I will give that to you. Uh, the other ones are a lot more complicated. Um, I asked our, the lawyer we have in our labor relations division about the issue with the credit cards. And she was like, oh my God, that's really complicated. So we're going to sit down and, and figure that out and hopefully get you a good answer. And then the census department, Councillor Abeta Stuve has... Um, the, the we think they have the information you were asking for in terms of the the average hours someone who is a server in the state is getting. So we'll check to see what we can get. But that's why I was on the phone. I was trying to see if I can get you the stuff. If if I can't get you that information by the time we get off, I'll email it to you. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, and for for Councillor uh, Mr. Mayor for Councillor Vasquez's question, yeah, I I just want to tell people kind of some of my personal experience here, which is that my email got out to um, people for who are needing unemployment. And so I've probably gotten in the 6,000 range of people that have emailed me over the last six months um, having issues with unemployment. And the one thing that this uh, experience has taught me is that every single dollar for a low wage worker counts big time, huge. Uh, let me just give you an example. About four or five weeks ago, we had uh, an issue with our office where uh, because of the volume of people that were on our system, we had a delay, what we call the batch uh, that we ran on a Sunday night, which, which at the end of the day for workers meant that there was a 24 hour delay 
in unemployment getting out. It was just one day. But in that day, we got tens of thousands of phone calls. I got hit with every email under the sun saying, where's my money? I need this money. Um, literally, that money goes right out the door within an hour after I get it. I mean, we have people that that literally check their debit cards at seven in the morning on a Monday morning that know generally when the bank uh, transfers it into a direct deposit and, and that money is spent. I mean, there's there's not any cushion for these folks. And, and just as a, as a more recent example, uh, the $600 extra unemployment payments, the last of those went out uh, in July. And then we were able to, to get the extra $300 through the lost wages program out. Um, we, we sent a chunk out two weeks ago. We were able to get the last $300 payment in addition to unemployment out last week. And when that, when it became public knowledge that we're getting this money out, we got tons of calls. I mean, we have 122, 123,000 people or so in the state that are receiving unemployment benefits right now. And these dollars are critical. And it has just been a, a crash course for me in how fast people at the lower end of the income spectrum recycle those dollars back into rent, food, uh, supplies for their kids to go to school. I mean, that money does not stick around. And so I guess, Counselor Vasquez, just from a personal perspective, in terms of, you know, I hear where the businesses are coming from and, and, and we're all in a tough spot right now and I get it and it's rough. But I would also say just from my own personal perspective, dealing with this from a worker perspective, every dollar counts. Every single dollar counts so much. And, and it's, it's, not, it's not not recycled back in the community. That money is spent right away. And I, I don't know if that answers your question, Counselor, but that's kind of where, where I've been here um, over the last six months and what I've seen. Thank you, Secretary. Um, I appreciate your commentary. And I think that's to my point in trying to figure out exactly where those hourly increased hourly wages go towards the overall income, the overall earning power of a server who's making, you know, according to the New Mexico Restaurant Association, at least $13 an hour on tipped wages. That's $27,000 a year. That is that is scraping to get by if you could even afford one of the, you know, I mean, $500 one bedroom apartment with utilities and a car payment and insurance and hope and probably your own health care. You can't do it on $27,000 a year. And so that income uh, tax return that you do get, if you can offset um, your tax liability through two more dollars of hourly wages is a big deal because that means you might get to make that big car repair, you know, from your car that broke down. Um, on the way to work, it might mean that you get to pay for two months of childcare. It might mean you get to pay for a half of a semester of, you know, community college. And so that's a that to me is a big deal. Those two dollars, I think, ultimately go a long way. Um, if I'm thinking about how how this actually impacts the overall earning of of a tipped um, wage earner. So uh, those are all my my comments and questions for now. Thank you, uh, Mayor, and thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, uh, Councillor Beta Stevie. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Marcy. You actually you hit on something that um, I think is really important, and we we talked about that how little those checks are at the end of the week. Um, we used to laugh with me and my colleagues back when I worked as a server. We had two different categories. We had people that were, I would say, they were more well off. A lot of them were getting assistance from family members or things like that, and they left their checks behind because it wasn't worth it to grab two dollars or four dollars um, for the checks. Um, and then you had people like myself and my sister who had to pick up those four dollar checks, and we didn't even have a bank account, and so uh, because we didn't, we couldn't meet minimum thresholds because we were really turning out everything just straight to, you know, those basic necessities of life, food, rent, and basic utilities. And so we would go and um, drive to a pawn shop that had a check cashing place. And that's how we would, we'd save up for a couple weeks and then we'd go and turn in our checks and get that money, which we would then budget for stuff like that. So, you know, I think that's the reality that you do have those two different groups. Um, some, they don't need it but you do have a lot that it is every single dollar that really does count. Um, and then I think, and I'm not sure, it varies between restaurants. Um, not every hour worked is a typical hour. Um, we had stuff like side work, um, prepping, 
things like that. And in those moments, you're doing um, uh, service items, but those aren't tipped hours either. And so I'm pretty sure that's still very standard for the restaurant industries where you got to roll your silverware, do your side work, you know, take out the trash. And so I think there's just, um, there, there's still differences. Uh, and we have differences in rates of what the restaurants have for pricing for meals. And so if you have high-end places or, and I do consider Marcy, I think your, the games are, they're very well known. And so I consider you guys like a staple here in the community. Um, and so they're regular spots for people. But if you have items, uh, places that are not quite as well known, um, it's they're not gonna have the same sort of prices. So you're not gonna see the same tips either. Um, and tips vary between shifts, lunch shifts. You're lucky if you get those two to $5 per meal per customer, if you're lucky, um, dinners are better. and. Um, sometimes you do get little bonuses uh, from people, but that usually happens, I would say, towards the night shift. So it does depend for the servers on when they work, where they work. Um, Marcy, this is a question I do think you can ask. If you are able to hire new servers, I'm imagining that things are going fairly well. Fair Go ahead, Councilor Bita. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was going to ask if you're able to hire new servers, um, things are in your financial stability as a restaurant is doing decently, or at least um, isn't on a make or break for failure if you're able to hire new employees. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. ma'am. Okay. So uh, a couple things. Um, first of all, yes, the, the games are doing fine. You are correct. The games are large restaurants. <laughs> And, and I want you to know, I am not here necessarily speaking for the benefit of myself. I am here speaking for all those smaller restaurants, for the other restaurants that are struggling tremendously and may have missed this call. I know that we didn't have all the business people sign up, but I think a lot of people kind of missed what was going on because they're so busy working in their restaurants and struggling on a daily basis. One of the things that I appreciate your comments, Councillor Stube, as well as Vasquez, but one of the things I think that we're, we're missing here is the point of this. Yes, I get all the things that you're saying about the servers, but we're talking about, you know, those servers only get benefits if those servers have jobs. They're only able to earn tips if they have jobs. The only way for them to have jobs is for all of those small struggling restaurants to stay open. We are looking at that we are on a serious crisis threshold, that there are so many of these smaller mom and pop restaurants, these you know little restaurants that are really struggling to stay open. And this possibly could provide that little bit of relief that they need to continue to work. Because we have to remember, most of those smaller restaurants are inside only and they are only at 25 percent capacity right now mm -hmm. you know the games have been done well for one reason and one reason only we have patios we have giant patios we built those patios years ago and that certainly has been a benefit to us during these mandates but we're still looking at the majority of these restaurants do not have patios despite the fact we went and built tents for a lot of them they still are very much struggling because they're only at 25 percent capacity and we don't see that easing up anytime soon so if there is a way to give a small amount of what I'm going to call business saving relief to those businesses, that's a good thing to do because it doesn't matter how we do the servers or what happens to the servers if there's no jobs for them. And that's really what we're looking at is how do we keep as many of these people employed as possible? You know, how do we keep a, as many jobs in our community as possible? We don't have that many big industries coming into our town. We don't have that many big employers looking to relocate to Las Cruces or currently here. You know, every person in this community needs to have a job. And in order for them to have those jobs, we must have businesses open in order to employ them. And, you know, the purpose of, I believe the mayor's purpose of this was to help these small struggling businesses. So, you know, that's a big piece of it is that how do we keep as many jobs 
functional and open and available in our community versus just worrying about the workers because it won't matter whether we pay them two dollars an hour four dollars an hour or fifteen dollars an hour if the business is not open and those jobs are not available and i think that's a very very important point to focus on versus the you know minutia of you know how it works and their tax liabilities and those things it is the fact that we've got to help the businesses stay open so that we can keep these people employed and so that they get a chance to make those tips they get a chance to make that money and to do that and i will also say yes your analysis of uh, lunch versus dinner not quite uh, most of my lunch I, I have servers that just work lunch shifts because they have children at home and so they've chosen to work lunch so they can be home with their children at night and most of those servers actually end up making more than my nighttime servers because they have their regulars and because they're allowed to spend more time with their customers because the volume's not the same um, so just just some points of it but the big piece of it is is we need to focus on what can we do to keep these businesses open to keep these jobs available to people and to keep businesses from closing or moving out of state or you know and that type of thing and that that really is a huge focus thank you and if, if i can inter, if, if i can jump in real quick counselor and, and thank you marcy and counselor uh, just as a reminder i wasn't looking at this being permanent this was uh, let's just use me for an example i'm waiting for that vaccine I, I have yet to go eat at a restaurant. Uh, we'll go out. Uh, we'll have it ordered or um, take out every, usually every weekend and, and have it brought in. I'm just thinking, you know, uh, if, if things were to go well, hopefully by March or April, the vaccine will hit and then it'll give encouragement for people to start going out and eating in, in, in restaurants and whether it's outside or inside. I'm just worried about the winter time that it's going to constrict and not be out there so i'm not i'm not looking i wasn't looking for anything permanent i'm we're just a really short three four month period kind of let uh, businesses come up for air for a little bit and and then go back at it again i mean and and yes i agree with everything counselor vasquez abeto stuvi uh and como talk about how they they struggle but you know what those three or four months could mean the difference of covering that that rent payment uh that mortgage payment because they could lose it and as, as, as Marcy was saying, they could they'd be out, totally out. So um, I wasn't talking, and I know sometimes it's hard to think that, oh, well, this is future, you know, for months and months, for years and years now. We're just talking for a few months here. So anyway, I just, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I needed to uh, remind uh, my colleagues of that. So, Councillor Bates, just No, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and Marcy, you do be, bring up a good point as far as, you know, costs are different and it, it has been very hard during this time. Um, I, and I haven't, I've talked about being in the server industry. My brother-in-law is a manager at a restaurant in Albuquerque as well. And so I did, I went to him and I said, what, what are the biggest problems that you're seeing? Um, and with that recognition and it's operational supplies have, he said, have gone through the roof. Um, everything from the box of gloves that he has to buy to, and really this is how, you know, it's something maybe we can't address here in the city, but it's a state thing to look at. But he said cost of food has gone up, which means taxes have gone up on some of those things too. And he said, so those were the biggest bills there that just operational expenses have gone up. And we talked about this, if it's make or break, how it looks. And it's hard, you know, I don't like, to me, this feels like it pits people against each other. And I think there's ways we can help businesses because and I do think we've been trying to do that in different ways um, without taking away from somebody else, you know, and it, because in the end, there's consequences to that too. And then we're going to, in about a month or two after we take away from someone, we're going to have to be addressing those needs as well. And so I know there's other areas that have been big cost issues with restaurants these days. And so that's something to consider and to look at and how to help with perhaps um, working with those modes. But that's all my comments I have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Bencomo. Thanks, Mayor. Um, thanks to my colleagues for their comments and questions. Um, I think, you know, I want to also just push back a, a little against the the brief comment that was dropped in the conversation about um, this council not the mayor perhaps being the only one wanting to support small business. I think, you know, from what I hear and from my colleagues, and I'll certainly speak for myself, 
I want to make sure that we help small business that's not at the expense of the workers. And I feel like some of this conversation is that. Um, I think we're centering the conversation around, um, you know, and tipped workers making minimum wage, but uh, right, like bringing them back to minimum wage when if they're making more than that, we should be happy they're making more than minimum wage. That's a good thing um, for people who work in um, low wage industries. And so um, I just want to push back against that a little bit. And then, you know, also, I just want to name, I reached out to a couple of folks, tipped workers, a couple of folks reached out to me. And here's some of what I heard. This pandemic isn't over yet. And honestly, people would rather be at work than at home on unemployment, right? We have made the dominant narrative about people on unemployment is nasty. We have made this whole story about who those people are and, and it's something we should break away from anyway, right? But folks would rather be working. And what I hear from people is every single day I go to work, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what if this is the day I get sick? What if this is the day I get COVID? How am I going to pay for those bills? Because sure, maybe I'm making some good tips, but I'm not making enough to pay for health care, to pay for my medical bills. I'm hearing folks saying there are a lot of folks coming to eat at restaurants that are not taking it seriously. I'm watching my manager, the owner of my restaurant, walking around without a mask on, right? Like what kind of leader, like that, that sets a precedent in your establishment about the seriousness of uh, this pandemic. And I think we all want this to be go back to normal. I think um, there is not one entity who is at fault for closures. There's not one entity who is at fault for the loss of jobs. This is, this is a pandemic that isn't over yet. And the health and safety of our constituents should be number one, of workers should be number one, of, of, of all our folks. And I feel like that's a piece that we haven't yet talked about. And so I just wanted to bring us back around in terms of what workers are experiencing as they go and serve and um, are face to face with folks that people are very scared still every single day, but they go to work. Um, many of who don't wanna speak out because they're afraid they might get fired. And so those are those are the realities that workers are living with. I'm I don't know when the conversation with workers will be mayor. I'm um, I certainly hope that you are reaching out to workers as well. Um, and and perhaps maybe my question is for um, some of our staff. I know we have Attorney Vega Brown here, Dr. Payares, um, Mr. Maestas, and Ifo. I am wondering about. What is a different conversation we can have about how we support small business in the next six months and the next year? Are there yearly fees, permits that businesses must apply for at the city that we can reduce the cost of those fees, that we can waive the cost of those fees? What are some of um, the strategies, ideas that we can have to support small business in this time that is not on the backs of workers? You looking for the answer today or you want this? I would um, like to know if we've had some of those conversations, if those yeah. are things that we've considered. You know, Councillor, uh, but really, okay, so let's use the example of what we did um, last month and, and how the report that we got in that we're, we're, we were only able to help about 20 different restaurants with, with different meals. I, I guess theoretically, if, if we were to shift the focus and I just put a pencil to it right here earlier. If we spent um, what the equivalent, okay, I think this if this this uh, reduction, in my opinion, would be equivalent of about a thousand dollar a month savings to a business. So if we were to do that for three months. Um, there's roughly 600 restaurants in the city, so that's roughly um, you know 600,000 per month. So times three, that's 1.8 million. I guess. If we were to theoretically make sure that we gave, uh, remember how we do these uh, meals for those that can qualify based on their income needs? 
you know, how, how that's, that's one of the things we're doing, the vouchers. If we were to do that, I think then, then what you're asking, that would be the way I think we would do it. We'd have to make sure that, you know, that, of course, that they qualify from all aspects, you know, health department, all that stuff. Um, and, and we make sure that everyone gets a piece of the pie and we make sure that they get, they're they allowed um, whatever thousand dollars, you know, to somehow we, we, we do that. That's about it. I mean, it, we'd have to really research it and, and figure out which businesses uh, can qualify, which the majority of them will. And we all uh, let them somehow participate that way. That's, that's probably the easiest um, way to do it. It's the only thing. That's the only other way that 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 doesn't run a a foul of the anti-donation clause. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I just I know there's other ways, and I know perhaps we haven't agreed on much throughout this conversation, but that is something that I can agree on. That is something that I can get behind. That is something that um, actually centers. So you know, you said the uh, some of the other stuff, the the stuff we voted on yesterday. You said it was a band aid. This feels like you're pouring salt on a wound and then you're putting a bandaid on it. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking outside the box. We're, we're trying to come up with strategies exactly like what you mentioned that um, are supportive for, um, for businesses while still honoring the work of the workers. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that's something there, but uh, that's, just right off the cuff, right off the. So. Yeah, I would uh, love to hear from, you know, I would love to see something um, come from staff on, on how we can do that. Uh, before I, it looks like Eva wants to make a comment. Before I do, I just want to say Secretary McCamley had to leave, but he very much appreciated being able to uh, join in the conversation. And I uh, thank him very much for that. And so thanks for staff for reaching out to him and getting him on, on board. Uh, Ifo, did you have a comment you'd like to say? You, you know, <clears throat> Mayor, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilors, and uh, Councilor Bencomo. Thank you for the question to staff. I, I haven't really sat down in, in uh, with staff to come up with anything yet as far as a, a business, uh, a plan to help business in general. One, one thing I do propose, though, is that we look at it from an individual, uh, on an individual basis, uh, sometimes to, to, to have a, a blanket approach or to have a blanket policy for all businesses, uh, to help all businesses. Sometimes, it, uh, you know, businesses, certain businesses are struggling more than others and they're struggling in different ways. And so whatever approach we do come up with uh, as staff, and we'll start, we certainly will, we'll certainly take a look at that and how we can uh, propose a plan uh, that will help business, like you mentioned, without putting it on the backs of the workers. But I, I do think uh, it, it takes listening to these individual businesses and their individual needs uh, and trying to attack it with, you know, the sniper approach and not a shotgun approach. Uh, and so, um, meaning figuring out what their problem, individual problems are, and I, I don't know what they are yet. And so, um, I, and that I think that only comes from from going and talking to these individual businesses that are struggling, um, and, and you know, there there may be there may surface uh, come to the surface, uh, you know, some some general policies or some general plans that can help everyone, uh, but but that would be probably where I'd start is is just kind of learning and talking to these individual businesses and figuring out what they're what they're struggling with. Okay, so thank you, Ifo. It looks like Dr. Payadis has his hand up. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, if I could uh, go with staff first and then I'll go to you and then Councilor Flores. Uh, Dr. Payadis, you had uh, some comments? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the question. Uh, Councilor Bencomo, this is Francisco Payadis for the record. The one thing that, that I wanted to, to mention with regards to, to some of the um, thinking that, that was along the lines of Councilor Bencomo is that there has been a discussion going around in the Las Cruces Economic Recovery Board uh, that, that you created. Uh, and, and in this discussion, there is um, a proposal for a potential a reduction of the cost of business registrations. So that is something that will be uh, discussed, well not discussed, actually it was discussed last week 
but it will be uh, voted to take as a proposal to council uh, to be taken uh, to potentially uh, reduce business registrations up to $5 uh, for the remainder of one year. So, so having an expiration date with regards to that, specifically for a system with regards to COVID. Uh, th there is also, an, an, that's specific to the fees, to the business registration fees, also uh, reducing the, the cost of the late fees as well. So, so on the late fees, the void on the, on the late fees for, for business registrations. So the, this, is, this is going to be voted on for the Las Cruces Economic Recovery Board on Thursday. Uh, and, and if passes, and if it passes, it, it will be taken as a suggestion, uh, as one of the, potentially the second suggestion that gets taken from this board to council uh, for you to consider. Uh, the, remember that the first one was the consumer uh, res restoration of consumer confidence with the Las Cruces Safe Promise. Uh, this would be potentially the second um, item that gets taken uh, from this board to, to you. Thank you, Dr. Payadas. Why, why do I um, think that the state had something to do with the setting of, the, of that registration fee? I don't know why I have that popping up in my head. Is that, are you familiar with that at all? I, I didn't think that, that, that was set by us. Oh, David Dallahan. Mr. Mayor, uh, having been here a really long time, David Allen, for the record, the state statute is set um, the maximum that we can charge for oh, the annual bus business registration. That is $35. That's for an annual renewal. We could charge, I believe, because I've seen other communities do it, an inspection fee for the first time. And we have a lower fee for nonprofits, which is $20 a year. Um, I do have a question for staff. Um, rather than refunding um, uh, a previously paid business registration fee, I, I would think hopefully a better course of action going forward would be that we set a lower business registration fee going forward um, for renewals um, for a set period of time, say the next year. Um, our business registrations are uh, renewed on an annual basis, but it depends on what month you applied for your original business registration. So that's when your renewal is set. We, we stack, they all used to be January 1, but that was a lot of work at the beginning of the calendar year. So I wanna say in the late 90s, we went through the effort to stagger them all. So a better course of action would be to reduce the fee going forward for a year. We're, we're not breaking the bank or uh, funding a whole lot with $35 a year on a business registration renewal. Um, I, I think it's less than um, $200,000 total revenue uh, when you look at it. But that, okay. but that cap is set by the state, not by us. Okay, that's what it was. I, I, I knew there was, the state had something to do with it. I just couldn't uh, remember. Um, okay, so thank you for that, David. Uh, let me go to Mayor Pro Tem. Or, or Dr. Payadas, did you have anything else you wanted to say? You had your hand up still. No? Okay. Mayor Pro Tem, and then Councilor Flores, and then I think there's an attendee who has... Oh, well, we'll go to the attendees after the council. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks, everybody, for your thoughtful um, questions and comments um, to the business community that's with us. Um, you know, for some reason, our, our council, me specifically, have been pegged as not business friendly. Um, also have been accused of um, continuing um, to have our poverty rate as high as it's been. Um, and I tell you, every day I'm working on reducing poverty. Um, you know, depending on which data points you're looking at or sources that you're looking at, our poverty or our, you know is around 24.5, 26 um, percent. And I, I I feel like when we talk about this, that we're talking about real people. And those people, and Marcy has spoken, um, you know, very eloquently about her employees, especially those that have children. Um, and, and I guess what I, I want to say is that there are so many kids, especially um, in the zero to six um, age group that are living in poverty now, um, and the 16 to 18 year old time, um, age group. And so 
I, 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 um, I, I feel like we have to look at different strategies to assist. I'm in complete agreement with Councilor Bencomo. Um, I know that these are band-aid approaches um, and I, I, I just can't in good conscience um, agree to reducing somebody's income you know, by a couple of dollars. I think they're struggling. Um, and I think about all those kids um, that we are affecting um, negatively. Um, and and um, I'm thinking about, for example, Jardin de los Niños, these kids that are near homeless or homeless with their parents that are working so hard to try to get up and out of poverty. All the things that we're trying to do to get to 100% community, and that means for everybody would, would, you know how difficult it is for our people to get back up and out of and, um, you know, working and to try to make up for the losses, it's, it's very difficult. So um, I am also completely, I, I, I wanna, um, I don't recall, I don't, and I don't see her on the call anymore, um, is the lady who made reference to being in the home health industry and um, looking at reimbursement rates um, specifically um, to the home health um, um, business. I, I, I think that's something I can get behind on. I think we need to support um, somebody who provides um, quality care to our, 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 our family members that need home health care. Um, that won't be me soon. Um, so, um, and it could be my mom or my dad or any one of our parents on this call. Um, and so, um, I, I feel like that's something else I can, I can get behind is really pushing to increase the reimbursement rates for our businesses that take care of our sick and our elderly and our disabled. And so I'd really like for um, IFO staff to explore a little further, um, which reminds me during these um, kinds of conversations, it's important to me um, to have a policy analyst that we can, you know, um, um, depend on to look at all these different policies and strategies that could assist us um, all this data that is necessary that we have at our fingertips to be able to make um, these kinds of serious decisions moving forward. Um, and with that, Mayor, that I, I will close. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I think uh, Ms. Curon is still uh, available. In fact, she has her hand up, or maybe she didn't. Um, uh, Martha, are you still available? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, we, we hire, a, I sent you a letter yesterday. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but we hire can, a lot of family can, members. Can you, can you, excuse me, can you just state your name again real quick? I okay, know I'm I just. Sorry. Yeah. Martha A. Lozano Haitan Cuaron. Mm -hmm. And I'm the administrator at Home Care Inca Doniana, one of the administrators. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we hire a lot of family members to take care of their family because a lot have to leave their jobs to take care of the elderly and the sick and sometimes their children. And so we, we under this program, the Medicaid waiver program, we hire them to take care of their family members. And that way they get a salary, but with the minimum wage going up, you know, when they first started before, homemakers used to be exempt from overtime. So homemakers could work as many hours as they wanted. And then when the overtime went into, we had to cut their hours. And so now instead of just working one job, they're trying to work multiple jobs to make the same kind of money they were making. And a lot of them begged us not to pay them overtime and we told them legally we have to, there's no way around it. And so we cut their hours to, you know, 40 hours and we're still having to pay overtime because there's some homemakers that are willing to go above and beyond. And so they'll see more patients. And so we pay them overtime. But in, in addition to that, we've had to pay insurance, their time in between patients, their mileage, you know, a lot of other stuff that is not reimbursed. And so that's why I was asking the <clears throat> um, 
a guy from the Workforce Solutions about getting more reimbursement because every time the minimum wage goes up, it affects us. And we're not able to pay the employees more than the minimum wage because we don't get very much reimbursement from the different MCOs. The ones making the money are the MCOs. Er, I, thank you, uh, Ms. Lozano. Um, I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, for me is, um, man, those home health care makers, God bless them. Um, the things that they do um, and those um, that go beyond taking care of our loved ones is, is so incredibly important to me. Um, and we should be paying them a lot more than minimum wage. That's for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And listen, I've been an administrator um, for 17 and a half years. So I understand um, all the intricate, right, um, in terms of paying people 40 hours and overtime is also um, a balance, right? Because when you when you um, ask people to work overtime, there's a lot of things that can happen. There's a balancing act that needs to take place. And um, you know, especially being a homemaker um, or a guardian or uh, of somebody is it, it, that's disabled and or um, you know sick. It's very it's very difficult. So it's all those things that I can appreciate as an administrator that you are trying to um, do to continue to keep your business open and afloat, but also making sure that people you know, are, are providing quality care um, and not overworking themselves um, as well. So, um, Mayor, again, I, I, I think that's something that I definitely feel like we need to um, get behind as a council, um, encouraging um, Health and Human Services Department at a state level, but also at a federal level to start increasing those um, reimbursement rates um, for our population, um, which can be disabled and or elderly, that need this kind of assistance. So thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Councilor Flores. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I'd like to thank my colleagues for their um, uh, profound insight and compassion. Um, the, the, you know, and I'd like to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for looking into this. Um, I think that it's, it's a very difficult situation all around. Um, and it has forced us to, um, especially uh, Mayor Pro Tem's, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Gandara's uh, eloquent um, statements regarding um, the uh, a global approach or a holistic approach to remedy this issue. I think that I, we're all aware that it's economically based and, um, and it's an economy that precedes COVID and will follow COVID. COVID. Um, and we have to look at how we um, create an economy if nowhere else, at least here locally. Um, and we have to look out and that we, we have that charge as counselors uh, we are actually stewards in that regard uh, to assure that um, we do have an economic uh, development system that really brings in industry. And that's why I'm really looking forward to uh, our new city manager's expertise in that regard, Mr. Peely's uh, experience in um, economic development. And, um, and we have to look at um, not you know, what, what we're doing right now is, is, is we're, we're reacting to a crisis that um, was in, unexpected. We, you know, we never expected a pandemic. And, um, but, um, but then again, it, as I stated um, and has been stated by my colleagues, it's that we are forced to, to really take a hard look at what we're doing economically uh, for our city, for our constituents, and for the people who surround us, not just our city, but many people who live in the county, um, and maybe even in Otero and, and neighboring counties who uh, benefit from um, what we do as a city. So I, um, I too would like to um, 
I'd just uh, say ditto to everything uh, Amir Pro Tem uh, Gandara has stated. Um, and I would like our economic de uh, development uh, department, as well as all of our departments, to work cohesively. You know, our um, our budget people, our finance department people, our community development people, all around to look at what we can do uh, to really uh, avoid this sort of situation. Um, and I and it's really heartbreaking to think that. Um, that we're looking at reducing um, the minimum wage uh, for, you know, I mean, we're looking at this as if, and with all due respect, Mr. Mayor, I don't mean any disrespect whatsoever, and I really appreciate your efforts, but to think that, um, to think that somebody's wages are going to be lowered, which are already pretty low, of course, we addressed this before, how um, tipped workers would prefer to remain tipped workers and what they do with reporting or not reporting to IRS, you know, God bless them, they have to do what they have to do. Uh, but to think that that's going to remedy a, a situation that I think is, is much, the question is much bigger than that, is uh, really, um, really sad um, and unfortunate. And um, so I again encourage our city all departments and mr i think with mr peely at the helm uh, who has vast experience in this regard to really bring it together and um we um and i agree that we need a policy analyst someone who has uh someone who has an economics background um who would work closely uh, with City Council and especially Dr. Payares and Dr. Martinez and our new, uh, I, I think we're getting a new uh, economist in that department soon. Um, so I, um, I, I just uh, want to say that I think it's heartbreaking at this time um, that uh, we are here looking at, um, you know, all the issues that are really touching us. And I think that um, I think all of us do work on a daily basis uh, to reduce poverty. Uh, my background has always been that if you have a good education, um, you'll go move forward in life. And um, unfortunately, here in the state of New Mexico, and, and as it happens, I think nationally now, those opportunities are really dwindling and has a lot to do with technology, with the way we live, with the way, you know, uh, technology is affecting how we think and how we live and it's changing our behavior. Um, but going down, you know, but going, but achieving an education is very difficult. And when children are going without meals, when they're going without health care, uh, when there's a parent missing in the household because um, in many situations, um, people are not able to receive any sort of uh, any kind of governmental assistance when there's two parents in the household, namely the father is absent. So it, it, it forces a lot of families to be forced to, to um, it encourages, you know, I, I think there's a welfare system that is really inhumane. Um, and so there's so many so many things that we can do locally to alleviate that situation. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure that it's beneficial uh, as a matter of policy for us to take something away from something, uh, to take something away from something that a, um, a person was earning and expecting to earn. And um, so I, um, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to go on and on and on, but um, I, but I think that, um, it, you know, again, you know, I said it before, it's a hard call, it's a tough call, um, and there are bigger issues, greater issues, and I hope that the powers that be in our state and our representatives in Congress um, really work hard on this and, you um, and I hope they follow our lead, uh, at least the municipalities locally, um, insofar as the remedies that we find that are 
that are long lasting and not just turn on something like a minimum wage issue. Um, I mean, minimum wage is not a livable wage. We all know that. So um, th this is tough. And, and what I'm really uh, disappointed, uh, we're coming towards the end of the two hours that were allocated for business owners to speak up. And I really, I mean, Mr. Silva, Ms. Dickerson, and Ms. Lozano Cuaron, um, they don't re re really represent the small business owner, you know, the small businesses. And I'm not saying that Ms. Dickerson's business is huge, but you know, it's not like it's a franchise nationally, but um, I, you know, I, we haven't heard from the mom and pop uh, type of restaurants. So, you know, the smaller ones that might really be hurting. And I'm not saying that Ms. Dickerson, I mean, I'm not an accountant, I'm not her CPA or anything like that. So I'm not aware of her record keeping or anything like that, but we do have, um, we don't have those people speaking up right now. And someone coming to us and saying, you know what, I'm really hurting. I'm really, really hurting. And if you at least put a moratorium, a hold on that increase for a few months, it's going to make a big difference. We haven't heard that, Mr. Mayor, and I'm just wondering why. Um, and I, I don't know if we're gonna hear from the employees for fear of being, uh, you know, there might be retribution, I don't know. But um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for bringing this up because um, we, I, I, th this is actually a very wise move on your part. Um, it's a difficult, difficult situation to find ourselves in, but we have heard um, my colleagues uh, have spoken up eloquently and beautifully and scientifically, you know, they're basing a lot on empirical data and what we see here. And, um, and it's raised this to a different level. So I want to thank you for that, Mr. Mayor, and thank my colleagues, and uh, God bless us all on this one. Thank you. You're welcome, Councillor. <clears throat> so, um, no, the we're, that's why we're going past our, our uh, time limit, because it um, didn't appear that any employees have were either aware of this or chose not to sign up. So I figured we'll just have a little bit more discussion here. So it uh, looks like... Um, Marcy is going to speak or has a question. Marcy, comment. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Marcy Dickerson with The Game. This is actually an, just a suggestion. It goes back multiple comments um, when Councillor Stuve and Councillor Bencomo suggested that is there an alternative way to possibly help businesses. Just a suggestion. So every business in this community pays you all utilities and pays you all trash. My thought would be is perhaps a reduction in those rates or a reduction or, or a gifting of those services for businesses that can prove that they are under 50% of their gross income for this year. We all know that there are certain businesses that have thrived during COVID. We know that there are businesses that are doing okay. We know that there are businesses that are absolutely devastated. And I think those should all be treated differently for sure. But it may be something, and that may be easier for you than, you know, handing out meals and that type of thing, is to look at if, for example, let's say a business comes to you, they're able to prove their earnings this year versus their earnings last year are less than 50% um, because of the mandates. And perhaps they can have that, that, you know, I know you had a small grant program there at the beginning, but that maybe that it's something you say, okay, for, you know, the next year or a certain period of time that you all determine, you know, six months that their utilities bills and their trash bills are forgiven because that does help. Again, we're talking about every little bit helps and that is certainly one way to benefit the businesses, but it doesn't hurt the workers. And I know that's a goal of everyone. And so that may be something creative. You know, I understand the registration fees, but the registration fees, yes, it's a gesture, but they're really low and it's not really going to help a whole lot. Um, but something like trash and utilities, those are a major expense incurred every month. So just a suggestion on that. Um, to respond to um, Councillor Flores's question on the small businesses and the employees, not you not hearing from them. To be honest with you, this this meeting, although it is wonderful, I do not think everybody knew about it. I found out about it last night at about eight thirty, and as you know, I'm a pretty vocal advocate for small business and pay attention to these things. Um, so a lot of people I don't think knew about it. I don't think they understood it. I don't think they knew about it. I know the employees didn't. Not one of my employees knew about it. I 
certainly would welcome them to call in and talk to you. Um, but I don't think a lot of those smaller businesses knew about it as well. So it may be something if you really want to hear from those people that maybe what you do is 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 set up the, you know another meeting, but call them and tell them that you'd like to hear from those types of restaurants. And I think they would be more than happy to participate if they had the knowledge of the meeting. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Marcy. Um, not sure how the city advertised uh, the, these meetings, um, but I, I I didn't know how. You know, we just left that off to our communications office. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, you have a another question. I do, Mayor. Thank you. I appreciate hearing um, from Marcy. Um, she always has very creative ways to um, come up uh, uh, with you know different ways that. Um, the city can assist. Um, I, I posted this on my social media accounts, um, asking um, for um, recommendations, giving my personal numbers and email addresses, especially if folks wanted to remain anonymous, because I was very conscientious about um, people's fear on both sides, be it business and or um, the workforce. Um, and I did receive five um, be it emails or messages, um, and of those five, one person was um, against um, it agreed that we should we should assist the businesses with not raising the minimum wage. Others were like, we've worked so hard, this would be very difficult. Um, some that this time honestly doesn't work for folks. I was hoping that we'd have more of an evening meeting and again, opportunities that would give folk, you know, that people could have um, basically to comment. Um, maybe there's a comment period that can remain anonymous on an email that the city distributed. And I was hoping that, again, that we'd work towards trying to find alternative methods to receive this information, Mayor. So I just wanted to say from my perspective, I really tried um, because it's an important issue and I wanted to hear from everybody so, or people who wanted to talk to me. Thanks, yeah. Mayor. Yeah. Um, so Annette says that the uh, news releases went out several times. The chamber also sent out information to their members. And if you re recall, Mayor Pro Tem, um, I had, had mentioned a few different times, including the night. And, and, and so this was the, after looking at everyone's schedule, this was the only time that most people had uh, council members had available. So that's why this time was chosen. And the reason why I took them, I, now I did, I will say, tell you, I put the business owners first. But I felt if there's anyone that could do it earlier at 8.30, that would be them. And then, the you know, because sometimes the employees have a lot of things going on at 8.30 in the morning. And um, employers do too, but they have a little bit more flexibility. Um, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I'm I like that idea, what uh, Marcy proposed. I, we have to look into the anti-donation clause, that, that, that stickler, you know, that's always that, you know, anti-donation clause. So, um, and then we, if we were to do something like that, we would have to reimburse utilities because, as you know, they run on an enterprise zone and they can't afford to, you know, they, they run on cost of service. So we can't expect them to take that dip. So that if, if there was a way to do that, I, I think that that's good because remember, we're looking, I, I'm thinking $1,000 a month for those, for those restaurants. So, and not all restaurants are, are tipped. So there are some that are just flat out, you know, per hour. Um, so. Mayor, if I might. Yes. Sure. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I know that anti-donation thing that keeps like <laughs> a thorn on our side. But um, I also want to remind folks that um, publicly, since we may have a lot of folks looking at this, viewing this, is you know we put forth a lot of money into that utility fund not just once but twice for this very um thing for folk the businesses that are struggling um to pay that um and that's that goes through casa de peregrinos and it might behoove us to again um say this publicly um all the nonprofits that we gave money to how you know maybe contact information that um that so that um, people know publicly 
um, not only businesses, but residents, um, the, the nonprofits that we have funded and when that funding cycle will begin. I think that's really, really important. That has been our COVID response. And we didn't just do something early on. There's, in terms of economic um, department and helping businesses, it's been ongoing. And now with the meeting that we had on Monday, um, with the, the monies that we are receiving from the state, it'll be some additional um, um, additional help um, up to $10,000. So I think this is a really good time for staff to talk about it and find, again, different ways to communicate with our constituency to include the business the businesses. And I know Econ Devel Development Department is sending emails and those kinds of things, but I, I think it important to say if we could, Mayor, that would be helpful. Sure. sure. Okay, so we have Councilor Bencomo and Councilor Vasquez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, <clears throat> I was going to say something else, but just piggybacking on um, Mayor Pro Tem's comments. I'm looking for my notes from our utilities board meeting, and, um, you know, I, I think there was about <clears throat> excuse me, maybe 16 businesses that asked for that um, utilities support. So um, whether it's maybe on our end that we're just not reaching enough folks with this information, maybe that's something we need to look at because uh, there is that utility support, at least on the city side, right? We don't control uh, the electricity, but at least on the city side, um, there is definitely that support <clears throat> that has been, excuse me, that has been not um, minimally used by business. So we want to make sure that that information is getting out in as many as ways as possible. Um, and then, Mr. Mayor, I was going to actually say that there are you know, um, other folks on the attendees that I see that I would love to hear from. I certainly, I'm certainly really glad Mr. Silva is on. I've been meaning, sir, to if you're still on, I've been meaning to reach out to you. I. I've requested for your phone number on the back end already, so you'll be hearing from me. I know, um, you know your stores in District Four, and I would love to meet you and get to know you and talk to you. But I see other folks on here, Mayor. I mean, Elizabeth Martinez, Irma. Well, Fila. well, she just jumped on. In fact, that's what I was going to do. She, she, I don't know. We don't know if she's an employee or an employer, um, but uh, we, we did hear from Martha uh, okay. Lozano. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we heard from everyone. Yeah. I know that. You know, oh, that's so, what this is for. So, so what I was going to do is, if it's okay with uh, uh, Councillor um, Vasquez, go to Elizabeth Martinez, ask her, let her speak, and share whatever comments or concerns that she has, and then go back to Council. Is that okay? Thank okay, you. so oh. that, we're good with that, Councillor Vasquez? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Ms. Martinez, Elizabeth Martinez, are you there? And if you are, please just need you to state your name and um, your comments. Elizabeth? Okay, well. Um, <clears throat> Here, she's unmuted. Uh, if you can hear us, Elizabeth, you need to unmute your phone or however you're. Okay, I, there's a new name here. We'll come back to you, Elizabeth. Uh, there's a new name, Edma Felix. Edma Felix. Hi, I'm here. I'm Hi. Irma Felix. Hi, I'm uh, the other administrator at Home Care Inc. of Doniana, and I work, uh, you know, Martha Lozano Cuaron and I work side by side uh, running the business of Home Care Inc. of Doniana. And, uh, you know, all the concerns that she mentioned are very valid to us, and our heart does go out. You know, this minimum wage has always been an issue regarding you know our reimbursement that is one of the biggest issues is why why we struggle and even giving raises uh fortunately we've been able to do some bonuses to our employees uh one thing i did want to mention is you know some of these minimum wage employees what happens is that in order for them to qualify for medicaid they have to stay at a certain minimum wage to to qualify for that insurance and 
sometimes it doesn't benefit them to increase them. And, and you know, they're the ones that tell us because they lose their Medicaid. Uh, so I just wanted to give you that food for thought. I know it's a complicated issue, but thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Irma. Mm -hmm. um, and before we get to Martha, I, let me just check in on uh, Jason Silva. Okay, let me go back to see if, if Elizabeth Martinez says, Elizabeth, are you able to jump on the call? Elizabeth? Okay. Um, one more one more here, Lupe Aguilar. Lupe? Yes, I'm here. Okay, just need you to state your name, please. My name is Lupe Aguilar. Okay. And are you an uh, employee, an employer, or? Yes, I work under Marta and Irma. Oh, okay. I'm a registered nurse there, so uh, I work under them. Well, you guys definitely got the message that we're meeting today. Yes. <laughs> how, how, would you sh like to share some comments with us? Uh, well, um, I really don't have any comments since, um, um, what can I say? Uh, I, I really don't. I'm just really listening and, and, you're, and understand. you're there for moral support of, of Martha and and Irma. Yes, yes sir. Okay, uh, okay. Um, Elizabeth Martinez, you there? Okay. Let's uh, drop back down to Martha Lozano Curon. Martha, did you have your hand up, or did you forget to put it down? So you may have forgot. Um, I'm sorry, this is Martha Lozano Cuaron. Um, no, what I was going to add is Elizabeth is having trouble to unmute herself. So she does work for us and she runs our, our uh, PCS, which is that Medicaid waiver I was telling you about. Uh, the other thing, besides what Irma mentioned about the employees losing their insurance, is also their food stamps. Uh, they make more money so they don't qualify for food stamps. So a lot of times, when we ask employees to work more hours, they won't because they don't want to lose their food stamps and their benefits. And that creates a big problem for us. We have okay. about 150 patients and under that program and probably 197 employees to service. Okay, no, those are uh, information that definitely we can take away from that, you know, we. I, I can't speak for others, but that um, was not aware of, and it, it makes sense. So it sounds like the the more they make, so th gosh, if, if if minimum wage goes to twelve dollars an hour, it's going to push some of workers as well as recipients, uh, maybe not even qualifying from healthcare. Is that what I'm hearing you're saying? Yes, yes, that's correct. So even those parents who start getting paid more. Because they're going to find themselves in a different, different um, category. Yeah, category. Um, they won't be able to use your services because the state or, or they're going to be they'll looked upon their, as making. They'll lose their, their, they'll, they will lose their qualification for Medicaid. And so they won't be able to be serviced under that program. I gotcha. Okay. Hmm, interesting. Because we also like have, besides the PC, under the PCS, we, uh, we have the Disabled and Elderly uh, program, and we also have the um, IPSTAT, which is the kids under 21. PCS is for over 21. IPSTAT is for under 21. Gotcha. Um, one, more, one more question from uh, Marcy, and then we'll go back to council. Yes, Marcy. Do you have a question? Marcy Dickerson. Oh, there we go. I apologize. Marcy Dickerson, for the record. You all mentioned that you approved some grant funding or other sources of small business aid in yesterday's meeting. Could you please say for the record and for all the people listening, 
where does a small business or a business go to apply for that assistance that you approved yesterday? Uh, Dr. Martinez, Griselda, Griselda Martinez. Yes, good morning, uh, Council Mayor. Uh, Griselda Martinez, Economic Development Director, for the record. Uh, we are currently uh, finalizing the application. If you want to contact us about this grant program for businesses, the email address to use is econdev at las-cruises.org. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Can okay, Councilor. I, I think it's important that she talk specifically about the matrix, like what you're asking folks to do, and what the qualifications would be. I, I think it's so important. Can we get that information again? Dr. Martinez, did you hear the question from Mayor yeah. Potem? Yes, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pratem, um, the qualifications are as per the CARES Act. It is businesses less than 50 employees as of February of 2019. Uh, it is businesses uh, with revenues less than $2 million. Um, that businesses that can prove uh, a hardship due to COVID-19 and um, the city will be utilizing a matrix um, uh, given points for the different criteria. One of them is having received uh, assistance from federal, state, and, and other local programs. Um, the number of employees with a higher uh, ranking if they're smaller, um, uh, one to 10, versus those um, 40 to 50. Um, if they are owned by socially disadvantaged groups, such as um, minorities or um, veterans or female-owned businesses, um, and if they, if they have been curtailed by the public health order as well. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, um, the information will be disseminated through various channels, um, utilizing our uh, partnerships in the community We'll do radio spots in English and in Spanish. We will do um, also newspaper ads and social media, um, all of this in Spanish and in English as well. Uh, and we'll, we'll, continue, we'll make sure that this information gets disseminated to as many, as many people as possible. Um, I also mentioned that we will um, send an email to you all and, and ask if City Council can share among your networks, so that that should be coming to you shortly. If if you could help us with that as well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. And if I may just say to my colleagues, I, I know this is kind of a slight tangent, but I'm going to have to leave it at that because we can't be discussing any other programs because our, our main focus was minimum wage. So if we can just kind of circle back and, and and keep the discussion to that, so we'll just leave it at that, from Dr. Martinez. So I appreciate that very. Uh, uh, detailed um, explanation. So, Councilor Vasquez, Ben Como, and Abita Stubi. Councilor Vasquez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I just want to say I appreciate the, the comments, uh, sentiments of my colleagues regarding um, some more creative ways to provide business assistance that's not that's not on the back of, of workers and that doesn't pit uh, folks against each other. Um, you know, I think we can do that. I think we continuously talk about the the financial position that the city is in, how well run the city is. Um, we are in a better position than most, uh, probably not just in New Mexico, but across the country to really come up with. In oh, we lost you. Programs, uh, especially using the Telshore fund um, th that I'm breaking up a little bit. I apologize for that. Um, a little bit. And so, so I think it's incumbent upon us to use, um, you know, the city's financial position uh, the city's um, reputation for being well run and the talented staff that we have uh, to create business assistance programs using our existing funds uh, that that don't that don't have to be on the back of workers that don't have to go back to this divisive discussion about minimum wage and and that pit workers or members of our community or even even political parties against each other because I think that's that's what we do 
uh, whenever we talk about lowering or raising wages to benefit any one particular um, uh, entity, whether it's businesses or workers. And so um, I appreciate your ideas, Mayor, um, and, and thinking critically as, as well as, as uh, Mr. Ifo Peely said about how, how a business assistance program rolls out to those communities or to those businesses that need them the most is important. Um, I continue to think about, you know, the, the franchisees or the, you know, or even the national corporations, the Applebee's and um, Ruby Tuesdays and others uh, who are in better financial positions. Um, not, not so much maybe the franchisees, but the national corporations, uh, do they really need a thousand dollars, right? So uh, a month in assistance. And so be, being sure that those dollars are rolled, doled out responsibly to the small businesses that, that need them most um, I think is going to be an important part of, of how we might roll this out so that it's not that blanket approach and, and we're essentially giving money to corporations that uh, probably pay no federal taxes anyway because they're they're part of you know large multinational conglomerates that own all these different companies and so we got to be careful about doing that um, in terms of that cliff effect you know we've heard this during the minimum wage discussions in the past when it comes to child care assistance um, the child care providers have consistently told us that if we raise minimum wage, that parents um, aren't going to be able to provide uh, pay for child care, uh, including some of their own employees, uh, because they'll be making above a threshold that that um, uh, doesn't allow them to collect that child care subsidy. Uh, this is so this is so wrong in so ma on so many levels, and it's not something that necessarily we can fix at the city, but um, the system. I mean, Medicaid reform, child care assistance reform. Um, chip reform, it all needs to happen at the federal level so that we are not in a position where we are keeping people in perpetual poverty just so that they can get the, meet the basic needs for themselves and their families. Um, that doesn't do, that's not good for people, you know, to, to think that being poor is better than doing something better for yourself, whether it's education or seeking a better job or even demanding a raise at your at work, it's just not a good way to live. You know, for, for folks, I, I wouldn't want to be in that situation, but would understand the realities of having responsibilities like child care and insurance and um, and those things that are very important to families. And so uh, we're working in a broken system um, that that starts at the federal level and that's enforced by the state um, that that always that perpetually keeps people in poverty. And that sucks. That's really awful. That's not that's no way to run, I, I think, these types of programs. And so um I will add um, together with that that you know the the Biden administration is proposing uh, as part of its platform a fifteen dollar an hour national wage, and um, the same way we're talking today about you know we're 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 beholden to what the state um, chooses to go with, and we have to enforce that if it's a higher wage. Uh, and, and Secretary McCamley even said, "Hey, the the state's minimum wage is going to outpace our CPI tied wage uh, in the next couple years." Um, so I think we have to seriously start thinking about this in, in, in the event that uh, we do have a Congress that passes a, a, an administration that passes a national $15 an hour um, minimum wage. We, we have to start thinking about that now if, if that is something that happens, um, and because all these other programs will have to be reformed along with that, and we should be prepared for those changes if they do come. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to comment that, um, you know, we, we I think we have to, we, we always talk about this in the sense of how how our people are doing in, in Las Cruces and knowing that there's a lot of need out there, there's a lot of low wage earners out there. And, and so I continue to go back to the conversation about um, what can we do different as a city to bring jobs and economic development um, so that we're not constantly trying to patch up this, this issue of how do we provide assistance to folks rather than how do we target, you know, economically depressed areas with targeted assistance or economic development efforts um, so that so that we're actually creating and building wealth in in our local neighborhoods, and so that's something I look forward um, for to Efo's discussion. Uh, one of the ideas I I didn't want to automatically write off a tid, right? Because these are opportunities that come to us, and we say if we say no, Councilor, I don't mean to interrupt, but I think we're getting yeah. a little bit off topic again. I I think what you're talking about, I'd like to have another work session on because I think we do need to really study that situation. I, the comments you just heard from our Healthcare uh, from from those uh, ladies um, is yes, I agree with you. It, it, we shouldn't have to. They shouldn't have to worry about not being able to get raises or they'll lose their benefits. So we can have a work session on that. And it's just that because you know I don't want to delve into something that we're sure if we you know go off topic. Uh, 
Okay, Mayor, I understand. Um, my case, they're connected to the minimum wages. I, I think if we don't do anything different to, to bring economic development and higher paying wages uh, to our city, um, then nothing will change. And so I, I'm just um, I'm looking forward to looking at, you know, different ways we can incentivize higher paying wages and bringing in businesses that pay higher wages uh, in ways that we haven't tried or done before. Um, so I just wanted to, to make that comment as we continue this conversation. No, absolutely. I, 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 I want to have that. That's good. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilor Bencomo? Honestly, Mayor, thank you. I am. Um... I won't be able to say what I was going to as great as Councilor Vasquez said. I was just really concerned about the comment that was made regarding wages and people not being able to um, get food stamps and Medicaid. We cannot live in an economy economy that perpetually um, puts people in that keeps people in poverty. Yeah, right, and I agree. We have to look at anti poverty programs in our city. Um, I have some ideas that I'm not totally ready to share yet, but I think, but I'm excited to have a work session where I could potentially share some of my research and, um, I, we, yeah, we can't, you know, $12 an hour isn't living, isn't a living wage. And that's why people are worried about making 12 as opposed to seven or whatever, because it's still not a living wage in New Mexico, arguably one of the most affordable States in the country. Yeah. But, um, I just got to throw this in there. This is, that's not that's not the state city's doing. It's the state's doing. You know, they're the ones who control the Medicaid. They're the ones who control uh, these reimbursement levels. Uh, Councilor Abeta Stubi. Thank you, Mayor. My comments were very similar to my previous councilors. Um, I am wondering if it's something that we need to consider as we talk about um, minimum wages uh, to make sure we're utilizing our lobbyists and other advocates and champions for the city to make sure that we look at those reimbursement rates as well and um, that we're adjusting because as we've seen today, it affects all different um, industries and especially I, I know healthcare is such a big one here. And I know it, it's not even just this, but there's even you know insurance reimbursement rates that really affect us um, and the type of care that people can receive here, the doctors that want to stay here, um, nurses, everybody. So um, I, I think that's something that we definitely want to make sure that we're looking at and hopefully championing uh, later on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Sword. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> you did some back of the envelope uh, 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 mathematics on uh, businesses that how much they would um, uh, gain or lose uh, doing what we're asking uh, to be done here today. Um, I didn't quite catch it. Did you take your, give me, I, I want to use the example of a small restaurant that employs about 10 people or a little more, maybe even a little less. Um, if this uh, 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 tip wage would uh, change how much would they save? How much would that business save if if it was dropped? You mean if uh, if it went down to the two thirty five an hour? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, so that's what about a dollar? How much is that? Dollar seventy difference. So four twenty minus two thirty five, dollar eighty five difference. So if you have uh, well a dollar eighty five an hour, right? And if you have, let's say you have 10 employees working at, uh, in that one particular shift. <clears throat> so that's uh, $18.50 an hour to the employer. And let's say they average six hours that day. So that's uh, 18.50 times six. So that's um, $111 a day. And mm -hmm. Well, if you were to do 30 days, but uh, I don't think, I don't, I don't know if every restaurant's open every day, but maybe six days, let's just say times uh, 20, well, maybe they are open every day. I don't know. So 3000 a month right there. Okay. Uh, roughly, roughly, you know, so all I was trying well, to get at. Over three months, we're talking about $9,000 they could possibly save. But well, under that scenario, sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm that, that's hard numbers here. So isn't that just about what we're trying to give away in grants uh, for the grant program for a restaurant like this? 
So rather than take it out on the uh, employees, uh, they they can get make it up from the grant from the the CARES Act uh, from the state. And so that's what I was trying to get at. And I think uh, Mr. Healy and and uh, Healy and and uh, Councillor Vasquez and and Ben Como, et cetera, et cetera, all we're trying to say is that um, let's target those businesses that are in trouble with these grants and um, um, just leave the wages of the way they are. Okay, so that comes out to about five point four million dollars, Councillor Sorg. So I just thought I'd let you know. Yeah, well, we got five million dollars to give away. Okay, fine, good. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So there we are. Problem solved, maybe. Okay, problem solved. There you go. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Councillor Vasquez, did you put, forget to put your hand down, or did you have another question? I forgot to put my hand down. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, well, this has been a good discussion. At least we're going to come up with a, another... Oh, Leanne Demush? Leanne? Mayor, Councillor Leanne Demush, for the record. Uh, Chief Budget Officer, I just want to remind Council that we do need to communicate the minimum wage uh, starting on October the 15th. So we will need some guidance today, sir, so that way we can advertise this on October the 15th. Yeah, I, Leanne, most likely I would probably say go with a uh, re reminder that it's going to be 10 50 an hour plus what the city's um, 420 an hour, I guess. So it's going to be a combination of the state's high high point and then the city's uh, high point on the tipped wages is from what I'm gathering. I would think that's a fair assessment and to move forward with that uh, type of advertisement. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so anyway, so I think we had a good discussion. I think what we're going to have at least another one or two work sessions, not on this, but on on some of the things that we've discussed, especially on the um, um, workers that, you know, that we can hopefully somehow come up with some ideas to send to our legislature to uh, not allow them to always keep certain residents uh, in, under, in poverty. And then uh, also some additional ideas of how we can help uh, businesses uh, with, through the CARES Act. Yes, uh, Mayor Putin. Sorry, Mayor, just procedurally, um, do we have to uh, um, vote on a resolution that was presented to us um, last week or? Yeah. What, which? The resolution, I thought it came in a form of a resolution. And so would we have to um, vote on that resolution? Oh, I think that's what, that's what Leanne was getting at. They're going to re redesign it and bring it forward for a resolution. Yeah, on Monday or whenever? Okay. I don't know if it's Monday. David Dalhan, Mr. Mayor, I, I think, uh, David Dalhan for the record, I think it's an ordinance because um, that's how minimum wage is adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll have to have a first read um, and uh, an adoption. Okay. Very good. Well, thanks again for joining us, uh, everyone. And uh, for those uh, panelists uh, or attendees, thank you for your Question. Did you have another question, Mayor Pro Tem, or you forget to put your hand down? Okay. Okay, if there's nothing further, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second, Gandara. Motion made by Councillor Vasquez, second by Mayor Pro Tem Gandara, that we adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 As opposed, aye. Aye. we're adjourned. It's 10 57 a.m. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.